Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins University Virtual GIS Day. My name is Frank Carriero. I'm faculty in the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I've been working, teaching, and mentoring students in the field of spatial science for the past 20 plus years at the school, and I currently direct the Johns Hopkins Spatial Science for Public Health Center. Um, we are currently right now in our featured speakers session. We have two sessions today, one in the morning and, and one in the afternoon. The afternoon session starts at um, 2 p.m. Eastern time. We are so glad you're here and we're excited for our group of panelists. Um, I'm not going to take up much of your time now. I'll pass it off to Dr. Michael Desjardins, who will moderate our first session. Great. Thank you, Frank. Um, my name is Michael Desjardins. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in epidemiology um, in the Spatial Science for Public Health Center at the School of Public Health here at Hopkins. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our co-sponsors. Uh, GIS Day is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future, an academic research center focused on the intersection of public health, the environment, and the food system. And we're also sponsored by the Johns Hopkins Spatial Science for Public Health Center, an academic research center focused on the development and application of spatial analytics, GIS, and spatial statistics for public health research. Uh, before I introduce each panelist. I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. So first, we will be recording this webinar and we will make it available on YouTube after the event. Uh, so stay tuned for that and feel free to share among your networks. Uh, please post questions for the speakers in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer all of them. Um, we will have time for one or two questions for each speaker after their presentation. And then we will have an open question and answer period at the end of the webinar. So that takes care of housekeeping. I'll now introduce our three panelists. So first we have Dr. Cleo Andrus. Um, Dr. Andrus is an assistant professor in the School of City and Regional Planning and the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. Her background is in geographic information science and her research is on mathematical models of social networks, social flows, and interpersonal relationships in geographic space applied to issues of urban planning, visualization, and geography. And she also directs the Friendly Cities Lab. Uh, today, she's gonna be talking about uh, a COVID-19 risk assessment tool. Um, and I won't give anything else away. I'll let her discuss that during her presentation. Um, next, we have uh, Kara Wegram from the Spatial Science of Public Health Center here at Hopkins. She is a research data analyst. Um, she has been involved in developing and managing the Johns Hopkins Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Dashboard and associated research projects. She received a master's degree in environmental policy from the University of Maryland College Park and completed training in spatial science through uh, the Spatial Science for Public Health Center. So her talk today is going to be on uh, the aforementioned Lyme disease uh, dashboard. And then finally, last but not least, we have Enshin Dong who is a PhD candidate and Lewis M. Brown Engineering Fellow of the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering and the Center for System Science and Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. He is also a member of the Infectious Disease Dynamics Group at Bloomberg School of Public Health. He is interested in inter interdisciplinary research on network science, mobility modeling, spatial analysis, geovisualization, and infectious diseases. His recent work includes forecasting the risk of measles in the US, predicting dengue outbreaks in Sri Lanka, building and maintaining the JHU COVID-19 dashboard and modeling the global coronavirus pandemic. So Ensheng will be talking about the dashboard, COVID dashboard that I'm sure everyone's aware of by now. So with that being said, I'll ask Cleo to share her screen and begin her presentation. Thank you. Hi there. How are we doing? Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, so today what I want to talk about is the COVID-19 risk assessment tool. I posted a link of it in the chat. Um, hopefully you can visit it and take a look. Tell me, tell us what you think at the end. And I'm just going to start my time right here. And I'm coming from uh, Georgia Tech, and this is a project that we've been doing since about March 2020. And what we're doing with it is we are serving up 
potential for somebody to attend an event where somebody else is infected with COVID-19. So this is what the tool looks like, and I hope that some of you can access it on the web. What it is, and we'll just go over it step by step through this presentation. It has a bunch of tabs at the top. Um, it gives you risk estimates by county. There's a new risk guessing game that I'll talk about. There's global risk estimates. There's a real time US and state level estimates, a tutorial and an about section. And this map about has been up about since um, about May 2020. And we've had well over 9 million visitors and it served up well over 20 million risk assessments. Our team is very large for this. We've had people from, it's, the team is led by Dr. Joshua Weitz, who is a very prominent uh, disease dynamics investigator and scientist here at Georgia Tech. And we have a large team of mappers, of postdocs, of people who are really good at web, UI, UX, and we're now working with some cognitive neuroscientists at Duke. And we have a publication from this tool called the Real-Time Interactive Website for U.S. County Level COVID-19 Event Risk Assessment, which is available online. And this was published last November. We're now funded by the CDC, as well as some other foundations. And from this, we got the CDC to start funding this research pretty late, but we're, and we're still very grateful for their support. So how did this get started? In about March 2020, Joshua White, he was thinking to himself, and he said, you know, in a crowd of X number of people, what's the probability that at least one individual, which could be more than one individual, has COVID-19 or is infected? And he was thinking about an Atlanta United game, which is our um, very popular soccer team here in Atlanta at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And he was thinking, what would be the probability at an event of that size that someone would have COVID-19? So from there, I kind of created this nice first conception of getting different events, like a dinner party, a wedding reception, a small concert. Here's the soccer match here on this um, x-axis, and then a large NFL game um, at the end of the axis here. And on the y-axis, we can see the number of circulating cases. And so for each one of these lines, we have the percentage chance of somebody or one or more people being infected with COVID-19 at each event size. So once we get up to a small concert for these high chances, we have basically a night greater than 99% chance of someone having COVID-19, et cetera. Um, and then this one is for Maryland. We actually pulled this today, but this was the original graph that we showed to people to say, hey, you need to pick an event size that you're interested in, and we will show you the risk that one or more people in this, at this event side is infected. This tool never accounted for indoor or outdoor, mask wearing, social distancing, or anything about herd immunity, and our tool still doesn't do that now. So the next step we wanted to do from this was to make it a little bit more user friendly and to make the spatial granularity a little bit smaller so people aren't just going by state, but they can look up their county as well. So our next step was to add geography and user input for a single event size. So we created a dashboard here where we have a map of counties. This one is zoomed into Georgia and Alabama. And the map shows the risk level of attending an event given the event size and location. So we allow our user to use this slider and choose an event size. So how many people might be at a meeting or a classroom or a party. And this took us some decisions on our part, like should we let them enter in a number? Should we give them um, kind of some different UI UX tools to choose? Should we give them different increments? What should those increments be? And we decided that these would be, um, these would be, these would work out for us pretty well. Then we also had to select an ascertainment bias, meaning that for every one known case of COVID-19, how many other unknown cases or undocumented cases were in the population? 
And we determined these values from local serology tests, which tested for antibodies for people who had had the who had who had had COVID-19, but it, they never got it reported on the books. So we allowed people to have a radio button for this, where we give a default of three, and that had changed over time. At some points, the ascertainment bias was a lot higher, but now we do it at about three, and we let the user change it if they'd like to. We got millions of hits to this website, um, we, our server crashed a few times because academic servers aren't necessarily really good for getting so much web traffic, but through a lot of perseverance last summer, we got it really up and running. So adding the geographic aspect of this was my most, uh, was the most fun part of this to me. And since it's GIS day to day, I think it makes sense to dive in a little bit more. So in this interactive map, which when you hover over, we have a tooltip that shows the risk, the county name and the actual risk level. We did this in our shiny. And one reason we chose our shiny is because we had prior knowledge with using R just for our types of statistical tests and data wrangling. And I teach R here at the university and our intro to stats class is in R too. So it's become a good friend of ours. We use data from the COVID-19 API from the New York Times, and that has served up county estimates since January of 2020. The only thing that the New York Times, one back um, kind of drawback of that is they treat New York as one area, um, when in reality, we would need five counties to take a look at New York City. The shape file data we have from this, or the shape data, is a JSON file. And it's of US counties and we had to generalize this. And so we went online to a really nice tool that allows us to generalize coastlines. And that made it so that when we have these more generalized polygons and we don't have all the details of the coasts and rivers, et cetera, it made it draw a lot faster. So we got that JSON file down to about two megs really easily when at the beginning it was over 20 megs. The symbology was a really big deal to us, obviously. Um, we chose red to calculate more risk. We didn't want anywhere to be white. So we have this sort of yellow to red spectrum. The red does get sort of deep into a little bit of a purple, purpley red over here. And if you think, hey, that's a lot of details, like we care about these quite a bit. And I think that we had originally pulled these from Color Brewer and we may have changed them a little bit. And then we use the common gray for no or missing data. And these gray areas here tend to be areas with relatively low population, although that isn't always the case. Um, we had to give good state outlines and county outlines. So we wanted to make the state outlines a little bit more prominent. And then the county outlines were less prominent. We're using a base map so that the U.S. isn't sort of just floating in space to give it some good context. And we chose the grayscale base map so that, um, and I think this base map is from Leaflet, um, but I'll double check on that. I think, or it might be from Cardo. Anyway, um, so we wanted it to be grayscale so that our colors would pop a little bit more. Um, the projection is unfortunate. So we have a Mercator projection, which really distorts areas in the northern latitudes. Alaska looks huge when you pan to it. And we didn't get Alaska and Hawaii in one view here because we were having a lot of trouble with that. Um, but we know when we use the web that web Mercator tends to be our default. The risk levels were binned according to something that we thought would be easy to describe. So over 50%, between 75% and 99%, et cetera. It was important to us to make this really easy to understand. That's why we didn't go something with standard deviations or natural breaks or quantiles or something like that. We wanted it to be extremely easy to, to um, communicate. So those were our map choices here. Um, and I know that your, uh, your team is, has worked on a really great interactive map, which I was able to visit and really enjoyed too. So I know you can commiserate or celebrate with me the joys of online mapping. Um, taking a look at the tool today, we have added some new features here. You can select a different ascertainment bias, which may or may not be very exciting 
for for the user, but we also now allow that um, vaccination status to pop in a little bit. So we are able to focus on states with immunity via full vaccination. So that means what percentage of the state is vaccinated. And how do we show that? So we decided to show that by allowing the user to choose a radio button, 45%, um, 50%, all the way up to 65%. This may, this scale may change in the future. And it, what it does is it fades out states that have more than 50% vaccination. So it allows you to focus more on the states that don't have high vaccination rates. And then the user can change this. We're now doing this at the county level instead of the state level. And we've been experimenting with different kind of alpha channel measures here. We were um, we were sort of inspired by some work by Rob Roth and team uh, about 10 years ago, I think that was talking about how um, alpha channels can be used to look at uncertainty, et cetera. So we faded, we decided to use this tactic to sort of fade out areas with high um, vaccine rates to show that they are less risky. There's a lot of problems with this approach, but it seemed to be the best approach uh, for, for what we were dealing with and to make it very, very easy for people to understand. We thought about, you know, graying things out, doing a bivariate, um, where we have like two different color ramps together. And this ended up being sort of the most straightforward thing to do. So today uh, we're taking a step back from sort of the UI UX type of issues here. And we're interacting with some collaborators from Duke in cognitive neuroscience. Now our tool is really trying to get feedback from the people who are using it, which is something we didn't really do for the first year. And we're very excited to be able to do this now. And we're very grateful to the Duke team for um, really digging in and saying, hey, we wanna know how people are using this, what they're doing differently. So now when you go to the tool, this didn't used to be the case, but now it wants to know your location because we are be connect collecting um, information about where people are using it from, say allow. Now it also has some nice uh, graphics here, which I was so impressed with, with um, the Duke team coming up with these great graphics. And it says you're viewing risk levels for an event with 50 people, which is like a supermarket or a restaurant, and it allows you to play a game. It also allows you to say, oh, hey, if you don't wanna play the game, you can also go, after viewing this map, are you more or less willing to participate in an event of this size? So users can come and say, oh yeah, I looked here and I decided not to go to that wedding or I decided that it would probably be okay to host a party or I do wanna send my child to school or maybe not. So now we're able to get user feedback from this and see how it changed perception of risk and minds. And then finally, this is, the game here, um, you have to confirm that you're over 18 and in the US and it allows you to select a state and a county that you're in. Um, and it gives you some different scenarios. And so you guess the probability that at least one person or more has COVID-19 and it'll tell you at the end whether our risk estimates were higher or lower than the risk estimates that the user has given. And these are tailored to the county that you're in. All right, so I wanna thank you very much and uh, please visit and share the map with others. Use it to make decisions on your travel, maybe for Thanksgiving or having people over. Um, please follow us on Twitter. Um, that's my handle, but an important handle here is the COVID-19 risk handle. It gives, serves up maps and updates. So you can get a nice map in your Twitter feed if you're a Twitter user. And Joshua always has some really great and very engaging tweets uh, that I that I enjoy following as well. Okay, with that, I will wrap up and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cleo. That was really interesting. Um, definitely something that people should be using before they're traveling for Thanksgiving and the holidays. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have time for one or two before we move on. Feel free to post them in the Q&A box. 
otherwise we'll have time at the end after all presentations to kind of have more discussion. So um, if you can't think right now, that's okay. I do have one question. I'm wondering if you have or will be considering the different variants, the prevalence of different variants per county and how that affects risk. The prevalence of different variants? Oh, uh, like the Delta variant? Delta and Lambda and, yeah. Yeah, and so on, yeah. Um, we haven't we haven't done that um, and how that affects risk. We have just been using it as just just basic infections. Yeah, sure. but that's a good question. We mm -hmm. hope that another variant like Delta doesn't come back up. Yeah. Um, do you think we'll try to reproject the map and leaflet? That's a great question. We tried that. Um, <laughs> I will have to check with the team maybe and answer that question, but I don't remember why it didn't work, but it, it didn't it didn't work very well. Um, and it may have been a user kind of a user issue, but we know Leaflet has very, very strong capabilities. Um, and we would, that's a really great question. Great, thank you. Um, okay, I think it's time to move on to our next presenter, but feel free to ask Cleo more questions. Um, and Cleo, feel free to answer them in the Q&A box as well throughout the session today. Um, so next we have Kara Wegram. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Uh, hopefully this is visible. Yes, very good. All right, so uh, welcome everybody. Today I'm actually going to be talking about another application of our shiny that many of us at the Spatial Science for Public Health Center worked on over the past year. And this effort was to build a dashboard for Lyme and tick-borne diseases. So why build a dashboard for tick-borne diseases? Well, the CDC estimates that nearly half a million Americans are diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease alone each year. Uh, it's the most frequently reported tick-borne disease in the US. And actually most of these cases aren't even reflected in the official numbers that states put out each year. So there's a big problem with under reporting. Uh, Lyme alone is estimated to cost the US healthcare system uh, over a billion dollars each year. And then the really concerning thing is that we're seeing more cases as well as cases in new geographic areas. So this map on the right here is the distribution of cases in 2001. This is CDC data. Um, and here it is again in 2019. So you can see this expanding risk, risk area for the disease. And although the focus of this talk is more on the US or North America, um, I just wanna note that uh, Tick-borne diseases are not just a U.S. problem. Many other countries, including Europe, uh, countries in Europe and Asia, um, and as well as Canada, are experiencing uh, the same issues as we are. And especially in the context of this expanding risk area for tick-borne diseases, there is unfortunately limited uh, public and institutional awareness about tick-borne diseases and also limited federal funding for research into prevention and control. And as we've learned in the past couple of years with all of these really exciting COVID tools that have come out, um, some of which you'll hear about today, uh, these kind of tools have been really helpful for um, informing the public and helping people make decisions. And there aren't that many tools for tick-borne diseases out there, and some of the ones that do exist have some limitations. So our mission was to create a public-facing dashboard that could become a resource and a point of reference in this domain. We always wanted to design it with researchers in mind, but we wanted to make sure that it was also accessible to public health practitioners, policymakers, advocacy groups, um, and really just the general public. Uh, we wanted to use this tool to support awareness and education about tick-borne diseases and also foster collaborative research. And then finally, being a spatial science center, we wanted to apply a geographic lens. So really showcase why geography matters um, for tick-borne diseases and how geographic data can be really helpful for understanding these diseases. So as we began developing the dashboard, planning it out, uh, we had a number of features in mind. Um, the first being that we wanted to make sure the dashboard was informed by the spatial epidemiology literature. 
Uh, this literature is really focused on understanding the complex interactions between ticks and pathogens and animal hosts, um, things like climate, landscape factors, human behavior. Uh, so really understanding how all of these different complex factors feed into tick-borne disease risk. Uh, we also wanted to kind of improve upon some of the gaps that we identified in existing mapping or data visualization resources. So one of the gaps that we wanted to fill was making sure that the dashboard had a One Health approach behind it. So not just mapping uh, human data, for example, but make, making sure that our data and our maps were representative of the interconnections between humans, animals, and the environment. And so these first two items really evolved into our wanting to create a one-stop destination for geographic data with this dashboard. So we felt that there was a lot of data out there, but it was spread across many different government agency websites. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we kind of brought all of that data into one place? Now, a lot of this data was already processed at um, you know, easily mappable scale, such as county level data or state level data, but some of it wasn't like environmental data, raster data, for example. So we had to spend some time processing this data um, just so that we could map it on a consistent geographic scale to make it easier for interpretation and any analyses that users wanted to do. And then really importantly, going back to our goal of uh, supporting research and collaboration, we wanted to make sure that all of our data was available to download right from the dashboard. And then finally, we didn't want to just throw a bunch of maps on a website. We wanted to kind of include engaging content that would make people care about tick-borne diseases and realize how um, important they are. So we wanted to make sure that we have like narrative content and things like that. So as we um, began to develop the dashboard, which took, um, I believe about six or seven months, you know, we started by collecting and processing a lot of different spatial data. Because this was to be a public facing dashboard, we did have to think about things like um, usage rights for different data sets. So we were largely limited to public domain sources like CDC, uh, NOAA, geological survey and things like that. Uh, the next step was to prototype our dashboard in our Shiny. Um, as we just learned, this is a package for developing interactive web apps in R. And here I've got a screenshot of some of our prototype pages. And you'll see in a few minutes that the actual live published version um, isn't too different from this. We also developed our narrative content, um, what we kind of came to call our story map, although it was not built with Esri. Uh, and then we kind of took these different pieces that we had and shared them with as many people um, that we could to solicit their feedback and make improvements. And the last steps were kind of to optimize uh, the R shiny elements, make sure that they were fast, uh, that the dashboard would be able to handle um, many concurrent users, make sure it looks nice and kind of follows graphic design principles. Mm -hmm. And then the last step was uh, deployment. And I just wanted to quickly mention kind of the deployment infrastructure. So we developed this R Shiny application that had two distinct views. And I'll kind of talk about that in a second. Uh, because this application involves a lot of different, different mapping operations, uh, data filtering, it's quite resource intensive. So we had to deploy it on a server that could handle that. So we used uh, the Shiny app server, which is from our studio. This uh, publishes applications, our Shiny applications on the web and serves it to the browser through HTTPS. Uh, so we got two URLs for our two views. We were then able to use these to embed the applications in a static website. Uh, so just a website, which you'll see in a minute, um, that has like a home page and about page, different elements that don't change too much. Um, all of our code for the website is stored on GitHub, and it is connected to our Amazon Web Services storage bucket. Um, 
So that's how it's seen on the website live. And anytime you want to make changes to the website, we just have to update the GitHub code and it automatically deploys a new version of the website. So I just wanted to spend a few minutes giving a quick tour of the website. And I will drop a link uh, to the dashboard at the end of my presentation. Uh, but I wanted to kind of highlight some of the features of our, our Shiny application. So as I mentioned, we have two views. The first one is this line map, which is accessible from uh, this button here on the menu bar. And currently this view is available for the US and Canada, although we do hope to expand this in the future. And really most of the functionality around this view is focused on the map. Uh, we use a map of Lyme disease incidence rates. And over here on the right, you're able to perform some different filtering. So for example, maybe I'm interested in ranking states by their incidence rates. Um, so I can do that here. Maybe I'm interested in zooming into Maine. So I'll just click here and it will zoom into Maine. I can hover over different counties to see their specific data. And then another feature that was important for us to include was a time slider, just so that you could either hit the play button or toggle through the different years to see uh, the geographic expansion of cases over time. And then finally, at the bottom, we just have some plots that show non-geographic data that still is really important um, for public health awareness, such as the seasonality of Lyme disease. You know, we see more cases in the summer months, uh, the age and sex distribution, total cases over time. Unfortunately, the CDC doesn't publish uh, this monthly data or demographic data on an annual basis or even at the county level. This would be really great information to have, but it's definitely a limitation of CDC data. And this is our second view of the application. So this is what we call the data explorer. It's also currently available for the US and Canada. And basically it allows the user to select different map layers from um, different categories and display them here. So for example, for case data, we include Lyme disease as well as um, any other tick-borne diseases that are currently notifiable to the CDC and therefore have data with them. Um, most of these other diseases only have data at the state level. So for example, here's the babesiosis. Um, you can also filter the data by year. We also have several different environmental layers. So here I'm displaying land cover, for example, and you can filter that by type. So for example, you could display developed land or water or wetlands. We also have climate data, so temperature uh, here and also precipitation. You can filter by year, you can also filter by season. We also have some socio-demographic data layers as well that we felt were relevant. So for example, here I'm showing urban rural classification of the different counties in the US. We also have Google Trends data, and you know maybe you're thinking, well, what does Google Trends have to do with tick-borne diseases? Uh, well, we anticipated that, and so um, you can click the information icon, and a pop-up will appear that just kind of walks you through what the map is showing you, uh, how we think it helps us understand tick-borne diseases, as well as where the data comes from. So we've done this for each of our map layers, just to make sure that our maps have context and that a regular user could kind of make sense of them. And then the last feature I wanted to highlight was the data download feature. Um, so you could, would click this button here and you're able to download tabular data, uh, a GIS shape file. So you could import this into any GIS software and visualize it that way. Um, and you also get a metadata file with just a little bit more information that we'll, than what we provided in the pop-ups. Uh, so that was a quick tour, and again, I'll drop the link and um, include it at the end of my presentation. Uh, we hope that you'll explore the dashboard more, um, and please send us feedback if you have any, good or bad. We're always looking to make improvements. So as I wrap up, I just wanted to talk about some challenges that we had, uh, mention some future directions for the dashboard. 
probably the biggest lesson learned for us while we were working on this dashboard was the issues with CDC data. Um, so as I mentioned, there's problems of underreporting, also timeliness. Um, for example, you may have seen that we had 2019 data up and that's just because that's the most recent year data that's available. COVID kind of slowed down a lot of state reporting. So there's been a really long delay. Um, and also, as I think I mentioned with the overview map of Lyme disease, you know, the data isn't as detailed as maybe we'd like it to be. So these issues have kind of hurt our ability to create the best possible dashboard um, that really could inform users in a real-time way. For example, like the COVID dashboards, you're always getting kind of a, a daily stream of data and that's really helpful for decision-making. And fortunately, that's just not possible yet for Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases. And so since launching our dashboard, one of our big efforts has been to try to incorporate other sources of epidemiological data. So we've been working, for example, to get insurance claims data. There's also electronic health records data. Um, we also have another ongoing effort to get uh, Lyme disease testing data from some of the major national reference labs. Um, it also would be great to get veterinary lab data because you know, the literature kind of shows that animal data can be a sentinel for human data. And so we're confident it's, it's taken a lot of time to get these things going, but we're confident that um, once we can get this data, it will enable us to kind of add some more near real-time data elements to our dashboard, which would just be great, um, a great resource for anyone coming. Um, of course, we want to expand our country coverage. So we've been working over the last few months to get data on European countries, and you can see just a little snapshot there. Um, we're always wanting to incorporate user feedback. Um, you know, we've noticed some issues with speed since launching the dashboard, which we think are related to hosting it on a public server like Shiny Apps. Um, but we have made some tweaks and improvements that have kind of helped with speed. We've gotten feedback on layout, you know, oh, it would be more helpful if this were here or you added this. So we're always trying to incorporate that. And um, we'd also like to just continue to add more interactivity and unique functionality. Um, I think the COVID application, the RShiny app that you just saw is a great example of that. Uh, it's very interactive. And so we're hopeful that we can kind of incorporate some of those elements too in the future. I just wanted to quickly acknowledge that this was a really collaborative effort. Um, it was led by the Spatial Science Center under Dr. Carriero's leadership. Uh, we also had really great collaborators at the Lyme Disease Research Center. Dr. John Alcott and his team uh, really helped us with kind of the content knowledge for Lyme and tick-borne diseases. Um, and also lastly, we wanted to thank the Lyme and Tick-Borne Disease Institute and the Lyme Disease Working Group just for inviting us uh, to build this dashboard and making it possible. Um, so lastly, here's the link to the dashboard. I'll also drop it in the chat. We do have an upcoming article kind of talking about some of the things I've talked about today, but in more detail, um, that should be out in December. And please contact us by email if you have any other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. Really interesting and glad to see that the paper was published. So congrats on that. I know you've been working very hard and quick shout out to Kara. She's been leading the efforts of GIS Day organizing and she's also presenting today. So I know it's been very busy for you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Well, I have a quick question. Um, I think we discussed this before at another conference, but a paper came out in September about the citizen science based data on Lyme disease. And they've kind of shown that ticks are appearing in counties that weren't necessarily reported by the CDC. And I'm wondering if there's any plans to kind of incorporate this citizen based um, data into the, the dashboard. Yeah, it's definitely something that we kind of talked about early on as we were planning the dashboard. And certainly since we've launched our dashboard, there's just been kind of constantly new initiatives coming out. Um, 
So it's, it's great that this is such a, a space where that's happening. Um, and that effort that you're mentioning is really great. And we actually linked to it on our dashboard, um, uh, the different tick maps. Um, so yeah, we're open to any data sources. That's our idea to just sort of kind of have as many data sources as possible. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to kind of include any more analytical tools like Clio's, uh, you know, dashboard of assessing risk based on different variables in your area? different exposures and whatnot. Yeah, it'd be great to be able to do that for tick-borne diseases, yeah. kind of develop some sort of risk tool like based on where you live. Um, you know, I don't know that we have that capability yet. I mean, and as I mentioned, that is such a focus of the literature is sort of understanding all of these different environmental and social factors and how they determine Lyme disease risk. But it's a little difficult to see how we would, with a good de degree of certainty make kind of a risk assessment tool like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, and thanks for the comment about the Google Trends. We're also looking at other kind of internet data. Um, for example, Twitter data. Twitter also has an API like Google Trends. Um, so that might be interesting to look at um, and just kind of other social media tools that we could scrape data from. Great, thank you very much, Kara. Um, if there's no more questions, we'll move on to our last presenter, and Ching Dong. So, if you please share your screen. Sure. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Shen Today, I'm so happy to share our stories behind the world famous COVID nineteen dashboard made by Johns Hopkins University. So. You may have been very familiar with this interface. Uh, this is dashboard interface. The middle part will be the main map. Each red dot represents the locations where reporting the current coronavirus cases. Uh, like in the US, each dot here right now represents the state level. But if you zoom into the US area, you will see each dot represent the county level. And for other countries like Canada, Australia, China, Russia, we have the data reporting at the at the province or the state level. And for the rest of the world, the data is reporting at the country level, uh, mainly in Africa area. Um, by far, we have over uh, 3,500 3, uh, dots on this map. And then you can also see we have a bunch of um, statistics on the left-hand side. And right now we are ranking this list by the uh, coronavirus cases in the past 28 days. And also on the right-hand side, we have a bunch of the epidemiology curves. And right now we are rapid, uh, we are reporting the weekly cases, weekly death, and the weekly administrated uh, doses administrated. Uh, why we are reporting at the weekly um, bars instead of daily bar, I will show you the answer later. So if you are professional, uh, if you are a public health professional, I may also suggest you taking a look at the, all of the tabs down below the map, where you will see the total number of the cases, uh, was the incidence rate. Incidence rate means the total number of the cases over the population, and also the case fatality ratio, which is the number of the deaths over the number of the case, and also doses administrated in each country. So, we also customized our interface into a mobile device. If you like, you can scan this QR code and take a look at our mobile version of the dashboard. Also collaborated with the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center and also the Civic Impact. Um, we designed this US uh, coronavirus map. Here you can not only find the information about the coronavirus, but if you click on uh, a county, like here, there will be a pop-up window, and this one will give you the local uh, demographic information, like the what's the population distribution, and also like the number of the ICU beds, how many uh, doctors in that county, and many useful information, which is uh, very handy for the policymakers and also general public. Uh, we are very proud. This one was uh, the winner of the best inventions of 2020 by the Time magazine. So we started this dashboard uh, last January 21st. Um, 
the reason we started it because uh, I concerned my family in China, and I even know one of my pastor friends. He lived in the UP uh, Center, Wuhan City, and I was so concerned of them. So on January twenty first, I talked with my advisor, Dr. Lauren Garner, and we all agreed to build a dashboard to see what's going on. And the data we collected can also help us to um, maybe for my PhD dissertation. So. Um, I used about eight to nine hours that, that day to build the first version of the dashboard and we tweeted it the next day and then Johns Hopkins University tweeted and uh, the academia, like the land setting practices, they tweeted. So this one became uh, globally influenced. Um, the time point uh, we launched the dashboard is very critical. Um, because it's just one day after the US CDC reported the first to confirm the coronavirus case and just a couple of hours before the previous epicenter Wuhan city locked down. So how about it, our usage? Uh, the highest usage we can go to four and a half billion a day. Um, here, the unit will be requests. What did the request mean? Um, so when numbers a user had a click on the map, that will be a request, or someone pulled the data from the server, that will be also a request. So in total, by far, we have over 200 billion requests for the whole, da the whole dashboard and also the data sharing system. And for the dashboard only, we have over uh, three and a half billion views. A view means you uh, load the dashboard on your laptop. So who are our users? Um, President Biden, he is the user of our dashboard because when he announced that there are over uh, 500,007 deaths in the US, he used the number exactly provided by our dashboard. And the previous uh, Vice President Pence, he's one of our users too. And this, the government of German, and the government from Italy, they all use our dashboard as the uh, decision-making tool. And this is from the UN. Uh, not only serve the data to the government or public, we also uh, serve all the data to the academia, especially uh, like the IHME. You may have been remember um, this uh, organization, they were so famous because they are making uh, projection of the coronavirus and their projecting results were even uh, even show, showed in the White House news briefing. And also our data is also uh, used by CDC nowadays, especially for this forecast hub. Um, every week, each of the team, they are using our data to make the uh, forecast for the next week or even a longer term. So because of this, um, usefulness and also uh, reliability of the dashboard data. Um, the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, she's even praised our dashboard as the most uh, crucial tool to track the development of the pandemic. So as a GS professional, everyone here know garbage in, garbage out. So we also pay a lot of attention from the very start of the dashboard. So you can see this is an initial version of our dashboard. So we collect the data from the reliable sources like the local health department. And also we are collecting data from many social medias like Twitter, Facebook, or even someone emailed us. And we, we will verify those data back from the local health department. And then uh, we collect the data manually, share the data uh, through the Google Sheet or the GitHub and also through the Azure platform, like a feature service. While we switch uh, sharing the data from the Google Sheet to the GitHub, uh, one main reason is the Google Sheet only support the first 100 users to download the data, which means uh, the 100 the first user, even though they can go to the Google Sheet, they cannot download the data. We don't think it's a good way to share the public uh, health data, so we switch to the, to the uh, GitHub. Um, since the February 2020, we think uh, we are planning to collect the data at the county level. You know, in the US, there are over 3,000 counties. It's impossible for us to collect the data manually. So we decided to create the automation uh, data collection procedures. And that's when we started to do that. Uh, in the beginning, we have uh, China's data ready because they have a 
very uh, pleasant uh, reporting system. So their data is, is easy to scrape. And then with other health, uh, health departments and organizing the reporting their data in a very nice format, we started to scrape the data from those data sources. Meanwhile, we are still keeping an eye on our um, Gmail because many users worldwide, they will send us email telling us what's going on in their, uh, their, in their location. And maybe those cases were not reported by their local health department, or maybe there is a delay. After we verify that this information, we will also share the data in, on our dashboard. Uh, at the same time, we also designed a tool called anomaly detection. This one is very powerful, especially when some anomaly happened. What is anomaly? Uh, I'll, let me give an example. Uh, a county may you you um, may most of the time they just report maybe a hundred cases a day, but suddenly they report a one thousand case for, for a day. So that, that may happen, but maybe it's an error. Maybe it's an error on the data pipeline, or maybe it's a typo from the data source. If that happens, our system will automatically detect uh, the error and send us the note, and our team member will go into the data source and verify information. However, you may also ask, what if a, a county like, like Los Angeles County, they have over 1,000 cases that this is really normal? If you use the same criteria, maybe you will get the alert every day. So we need to, uh, to customize our criteria for different counties to make sure the normally uh, suit for that type of the county. Um, today, this is our latest architecture. Um, you will say it's much more complicated and much more smart because we have most data uh, collected automatically. Um, and at the same time, we also had a collaboration with the Coronavirus Resource Center to, co to collect the uh, vaccination data, um, not only on, on the doses administrated, but also have the data like what the type of the vaccine and also how many have been fully vaccinated or are partially vaccinated. Those information are all available on our GitHub. So this is our GitHub. Uh, you can go to this website and to see our raw data. On our GitHub, click on the COVID-19 uh, repo and you will get into this page. You will see there are three folders. Uh, the first two data reports and data reports you asked, they are kind of like a snapshot of the daily dashboard. So uh, we dump into the data uh, every day from the dashboard to this GitHub. A uh, third folder called time series. This one is the one I recommend you to use if you are interested in tracking the historical data because we are frequently make change over there. Making change doesn't mean we create it or we, we modify the data at our will. It's because some official data, they suddenly changed the criteria or suddenly found in the previous days, they, they forgot to report something and then they dump the data. Uh, we have to uh, back to build or back correction some information. Uh, that's everything we have done uh, will be stored in this time series folder. So also in this GitHub, we shared all the uh, data sources links and uh, also the data modification records like why we did it and the where and when. Um, Today, you can use our data, no matter you are commercial or non-commercial company. And one of the good example of usage of our data is the Google map. If you use Google map, maybe to other countries or some location in the US, you will see the data of the coronavirus information provided by Johns Hopkins University. All right, so since most of, uh, most of the audience here, you are just professionals, I will show you some uh, challenges we have been met over the past two years, especially on the geo visualization. Um, here is the evolvement of the layout of the dashboard. This one is the first version. And then uh, this one is the second version. Right now you are seeing the third version of the dashboard. Uh, we have so many issues on how to uh, represent the data. For example, if you want to show the cases in one location, uh, you will prefer a color class map on the left or prefer a dot map on the, on the right. Um, so in the beginning, we had a debate on that, but in the end, we, we, you, we, uh, we decided to use the dot map. The reason is one, it's easier to maintain because a dot, you only need to uh, have the latitude and longitude to show its location and also have one field of the attribute like the cases or death. 
that's it. So that's the simple way to visualize it. But there are also some drawback of the dot map. For example, the, the size of the dots. If you are still remembering the ArcGIS online, maybe the old version, they only support you to uh, categorize the dots into 11 categories. You cannot go beyond that unless you use the desktop tool. And also we need to update the size or the scale of the dot a lot. So right now, maybe you see uh, this size of the dot represent uh, 300,000 to 2 million cases. However, the same size of the dot back to the old days, that might represent a different number. So we, with the involvement of the pandemic, we also involve our, our dot, especially on the size. Another interesting thing is about the null island. You may have heard this interesting geographic concept before. Null island means um, you, uh, you show the data in the latitude and longitude equals to one location, which is in the, um, somewhere in the western coast of the Africa. So this is what we do for the evacuees from the uh, Diamond Princess. Another thing is about the, um, the granularity of the data. So you will find most of the data tracking at the county level, but some locations we have to track at the different scale. For example, like in Utah, we have to track at the jurisdiction uh, jurisdiction district level because this is what the data provided from their local health department. Another interesting thing is about the French data. Compare with WHO data, you will see we have a spike compared with WHO. The reason is French using a very different um, criteria to manage the data. And we have to uh, see it into a news briefing every day to get those uh, specific information instead of getting the data directly from their website. And also we are calculating the French data, not the Europe French, but also other overseas, overseas territories of the France. So those two factors combined, we got the spikes for France. Another example is the spikes for uh, Turkey. Most of the time we will backstage, backstage build if we find a spike, but Turkey, uh, they report uh, that spike um, last December and we try to reach out to them, but no one give us any feedback. So if any of you know any officers working for the Turkish government, you're welcome to contact with me so we can back distribute their data. Uh, other interesting stories like the disputed territories in Cyprus, if the data from the northern part of the Cyprus or the whole island, or can the, because of the US sanction, can the people from Iran uh, read our dashboard or, the data uh, from Ukraine, Crimea, how to categorize the Crimea data, is that the Russian data or Ukraine data? Those kind of the very uh, haddock issues. And also the data um, reporting frequency. Remember in the beginning, I told you our time source bar are tracking at the weekly instead of the daily. The reason is many of the states, they are reporting the data once a week. So if you report every day, showing the uh, daily bar, it will be zigzagged and some one day will be a spike, but most of the, uh, the rest of the week will be a, a zero. So that doesn't make any sense. So we decided to track um, the, present the data in the, at the weekly base. Uh, this is data upgrading frequency. Currently, uh, our internal scraper um, reach out to the local health department every half an hour to, grip, to grab the latest information. And the dashboard that we are updating every hour and for the GitHub data sharing, uh, we share that one, uh, once a day. But for some locations like Israel, they publish their latest in information multiple times a day. So where is a, where should we cut down and count, call that a day and to call all the numbers before that bar uh, uh, the day, uh, call all those numbers um, the day before or call the rest of the numbers the next day. So this is a really headache to us. So in the end, I will share what we learned um, in the, uh, past two years about the how to collect the pandemic data. The first thing we want to um, want to have is the uh, make a clear 
definition of the parameters, like what is a case? Uh, if a confirmed case is a case, how about the probable case? Uh, how about a case tested by the an antigen and all the, by the PCR about the antibody? So how do you define that? And we also hope in the future data collection, we can have a better platform, like uh, all of the organizations that can publish the data in a standardized format, which is easier for data scripting, but not, um, we hope it's not on the Twitter or Facebook or on the PDF or even on the Tableau platform. It's really hard for us to script the data. And in the end, we also call for the privacy uh, protection. If there is only one or two cases, we need to, uh, make a strategy not to show those information directly on the map because that one will be easier for some other people to track who uh, who that patient is. It's not very uh, good for the personal privacy. So we also call for the protection of a personal privacy. So you can find all our uh, thoughts in this article. If you are, uh, if you have time, you can take a look at that. In the end, I would love to say thank you to all our lovely members. By far, we have about 45 team members. They are from different organizations like in Hopkins. They are from APL, Applied Physics Lab, and also from Library, and also the company, Esri, and the many sponsors. Uh, because of their sponsorship, uh, that made our Johns Hopkins not, very, not only famous for the medical school, but also fam famous for the coronavirus map. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enxing, um, and congrats again on your success. Um, we have a question here. Um, feel free to open up the Q&A and read it, but I'll, I'll read it to our attendees. Um, so Rika says, what are some specific tools being used in the automated data scraping for the COVID-19 dashboard? Um, I'm particularly curious about how case data published in image format is being collected. For instance, in the case of Laos, where they're currently based, the Minister of Health publishes their case numbers via images shared on their Facebook page. Yeah, if that happens, we will collect the data manually. <laughs> there is no <laughs> other smarter way to do that. <laughs> so we call that a human machine instead of, um, some, we design that fancy term, human machine. We are a human machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So how many or countries or instances of, of that, uh, you know, where you're actually um, manually scraping the data? <laughs> yeah, that really depends because in some countries, they are, uh, we are collecting data at the province or the state level. Maybe some state, they are reporting normally. Some state, they just report in the Facebook or Twitter. You don't know when they will publish it. It's really hard to follow. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, since this dashboard has had a huge impact on the way we share public health data. It's been great for, you know, downloading data from, uh, you know, using it for a variety of studies and just how many people have actually contributed to the COVID literature. Are there plans to use this idea to track other infectious diseases? Um, because obviously, you know, it's flu season, other respiratory viruses, um, and just other infectious diseases in general, I could think of, you know, say dengue in South America or Asia. Um, just to have this kind of one aggregated source for everyone to go to. Yeah, we plan to do that. And it's right now, I think my advisor, Dr. Goner, she had a collaboration with Civic Impact and to expand our project. But meanwhile, uh, we are also thinking the next step for the dashboard, especially for that URL. Um, maybe we will turn the website in the future into an on internet heritage to help the future people to track what's going on of this pandemic and how people react so this is our uh, near future plan mm -hmm. yeah. it's good to know thank you um, does anyone else have any questions uh there there is one oh, one on the q a can you elaborate on privacy concerns what were the solutions uh, yeah, so I want to, um, yeah, in my presentation, if you still remember the Diamond Princess, um, I didn't uh, give you very deep uh, information details. That was a good explanation for the privacy concerns. So uh, I remember there were about 55 evacuees, the US government uh, um, moved those uh, evacuees from Japan, uh, the, the Diamond, Diamond Princess cruise, which was in Japan. But there were only 50-ish people. It's really easy to track where they are. Uh, so we decided to aggregate all the evacuees into one dot, but where that dot should be. Um, because um, 
each of them, they were in different locations. If, uh, initially, we decided to locate that dot in the geologic center of the US, which is somewhere in Kansas. But the next day, uh, some local residents emailed us telling us, you cannot put a COVID red dot on top of my apartment. <laughs> uh, they don't like it. So we have to move that dot um, back to Japan where the diamond cruises was, even though that's not the real location of the uh, passengers. Um, so I think this is a one way how we deal with the privacy. Uh, we collect the, uh, the, the people into one dot uh, without displaying their exact location. And then um, we move that dot uh, from the US to Japan and then move that dot from Japan to the null island, which is nowhere you can find on the map. But at the same time, the data will be counted toward the statistics. Uh, so that's how we uh, manage that instance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, I think it's time to wrap up here. Um, I'll share my screen quick just to share some information. Okay, so thank you for our panelists for coming this morning to give us a talk on GIS Day. Um, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, just a reminder that this is one of two sessions today. Um, we have one more session at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We will be showcasing a variety of student, faculty, and staff research in the form of five minute lightning talks. I think we have 12 or 13 lightning talks. If you're interested, please feel free to check them out. We will drop the registration link uh, in the chat box. Um, again, this recording will be available on YouTube. So once it's up, feel free to share among your networks. Um, and thanks again to our co-sponsors, the Center for a Livable Future and the Spatial Science for Public Health Center. If you're interested in learning more about either center, uh, we will drop their links in the chat box as well. Um, and thank you very much and hope you enjoy the rest of your day and hope to see some of you at 2 p.m. for the lightning talks. <laughs>